Be wary of unexpected curveballs on the metaphorical road of life. Or even on the actual roads, as in when you're driving. Shit be crazy out here. So be cute. Watch your house for Ireland, as we used to say when playing football on the green. Life be a proper mad touch. So get your ducks in a row, keep your powder dry, and play it by ear. To be honest, I should take my own advice. Because what I say is true. But let's face it, being prepared can be pretty boring at times, to be fair. But I'm getting wise to the pitfalls of not looking after future Eddie. Sometimes, future Eddie looks back at the past Eddie and says, Are you happy now, you lazy prick? You could have gone and invented the best thing since Tetra Packs or Velcro. But even future me knows damn well that that's a bit of a stretch in fairness. Sometimes you just gotta take a chill pill, or as those morbid old road safety speeding TV adverts would say, slow down, expect the unexpected. Bar am you, your fleece, your breed, your clan be true. Shame on you. Sponsored by DOE and your old lady. Now, talking of morbid TV commercials, I think it's high time for me to go off on a big rant. Then we'll talk about more crazy times in Bugenhagen's car, road safety ads, and the ignorance of other drivers on the road. Are you ready? Song Jabin, off we go. If you've been forced to watch any length of Irish TV at all, you'll notice most of it's depressing, low-budget shite. Rehashed panel TV show concepts and hidden camera larking about jobs. BBC and Channel 4 are the kings of such shy panel shows. 8 out of 10 cats and would I lie to you? Oh, I won't lie to you. They're pure cat shite, man. What really does my head in is those thumbnails you see on YouTube with everyone pasted in to make out that it's savage crack altogether. As if someone has just blurted out the funniest shit known to mankind. Sean Locke or David Mitchell creaming in their jeans over a joke they just recited and passed off like it was some spur of the moment improvisation that gets a big laugh. And then he'll put the head down and pretends to write the next folly of guffaw inspiring contrivances. Fuck off, the lot of ya. My old lad had to dig tunnels in London as a teenager, breaking his back to send money home to keep the place going, and they get to ride around on the tube now living it up. The bastards. I don't know what that actually has to do with my old lad's physical toil in the 1960s, and what it has to do with mainstream TV panel shows. I guess it was just the way it was going. Irish TV would drive you to tears of rage though, boring weekly editions of agricultural roundups, or wanky rich South Dublin Klims wandering around mansions during the building process. News programs filled with an array of ashen faced dry bastards in politics, and trade unions beaten about the bush while being grilled by blonde milfs in expensive blazers. I saw Prime Time the other night. There's a lad in it whose complexion is so grey he looks like he swims in a crematorium bin. Dour faced heavy hitters grilling gammon-faced lads from the HSE. The country is fucked, sure. They're great at pointing to the symptoms of why shit doesn't work, but they never look at the root cause, do they? No. The only thing more annoying is adverts. I will go as far as to say that they are cuntishly disturbing. I'd be shouting at the screen there with the other lads. French Toast O'Toole got so pissed off once while watching a board be a commercial for cheese, he started crying. Fucking cunt. We had to give him nine Valium and a can of Druid cider to help him come back down to earth. He sat there then, dribbling away while eating a tub of Cadbury's Heroes, and he went to bed for three days solid. He didn't bother leaving the room, pissed into a washing basin from the kitchen sink. The stink out the place was unreal. 
I could feel his pain. Over-familiar, pseudo-friendly voices bellowing out corporate slogans such as Tesco Ireland, 3Mobile, Kia Sportage, whispery, posh-sounding, sprightly bastards residing within the pale of Leinster, gee bags getting handy numbers for peddling us shite. Sure, I could do that myself if I wanted to. She have heard my voice. It's tastier than curry cheese chips on a cold winter's night. I tell you this, man, every crow loves their own, and the advert game must be filled with back-tapping gatekeepers up in Dublin. A real-talking hamlet-dwelling scoundrel such as myself, I'm not brand-friendly enough, too spicy, not to mention, I hate marketing and advertising with a burning passion. Devious bastards clogging up your mind with shite jingles like, Washing machines last longer with Cal gun. Always Coca-Cola, I'm loving it. Just a few out of thousands of branded jingles lodged permanently into my brain bank from years of sitting in front of the one-eyed babysitter. Why do you think they call it programming? It tells you what to think, what to wear, what to believe. And we do it without question. It's fucking mind control, man. I'm no psychologist, but I've heard that when you're sitting down nice and relaxed, tuning in to some wank on the box... After a while, your mind goes into a passive state of alpha wave activity. The same way it would do is if you were to play music or drawing a picture. It hijacks the feeling of getting into the zone, disarming your defenses, making you susceptible to anything. Ask yourself this. After years of absorbing various films and TV shows, how much of your core beliefs have been implanted into your subconscious by pie chart toting wrongings? Is your value system really yours, or do they reflect those of David Platt, as in Gail Tisley's son from Coronation Street? You know the one. That devious little imp who thinks he's harder than Dean Gaffney's dog, Wellard from EastEnders. Even though he does be working cutting hair for owl dolls like Rita and Norris. The alternative cosmos of adverts is a bizarre parallel universe. People of every walk of life smiling away in euphoric harmony, gushing manically over some IKEA products, prancing about like dicks while promoting chains of English bingo halls, or a bunch of well dressed hipsters cruising around a city in a new electric Volkswagen Golf. Cunts. Advertising execs are empty vessels with no idea of who they really are inside. They care only about making maximum impact upon the public consciousness passionately hopping onto whatever's trendy. After one fad is superficially exhausted, they'll bail, hopping off like fleas onto the next culture of feeding frenzy, absorbing the latest pop singles as if they are the very elixir of life. This song is great! Until that is, something else comes along and it's no longer popular. The problem with today is our once universally shared objective reality is constantly shifting like Callum Best at the opening of a new nightclub. Perception of public image is now considered more important than the contact of a person's character. Society was doing just fine before social media came along. It was cool until parents, work colleagues, extended family members and nosy pricks. You were forced to add people then just to keep the peace. They'll have a good nose for themselves, spreading the gossip. You can't say anything these days without it getting into an argument that goes on for days. People shouting abuse at each other from the comfort of their own environment. It's an awful lot of power to wield, is it not? Old Zuckerberg, he's like the cat that got the cream. What is he like? Not logical. He reminds you of data from Star Trek, but way less charismatic. See him pretending to drink that glass of water there the time he's being questioned. Didn't even drink a drop. I wouldn't be surprised if one day his face fell off. Just like the cowboy lad from that 1960s sci-fi film, Westworld. He'll malfunction one of these days. Just know well he will. Going on a passive-aggressive rampage, killing a gang of numbers bods in the office. Who the fuck built him? Skynet? You wouldn't know, man. You just wouldn't fucking know. Vanity's been on the rise too, especially since those Kardashian Egypts turned up. They've done a lot of damage. But they've done a lot of good too, though. Sure, there's an awful lot of impressionable young women out there, overly obsessed with unrealistic standards of beauty, 
which means there's a lot of finers knocking about these days. The service is free, but we were the unsuspecting product, selling our information onto those clims and advertising I was just talking about. We've been so busy feeding our souls into the narcissistic meat grinder of big tech that we haven't stopped to look around at what the world has turned into. Freud once said that the Irish were impervious to psychoanalysis. They'd answer a question by asking another question. Loose lips sink ship's job. The result of centuries living under the tyrannic rule of the British monarchy. Since social media came along, people now publicly upload all their information voluntarily. There's a Galway woman I met a few years ago constantly looking for tension from grief simps, talking about how she's now put on weight, which obviously she hasn't, and how she was betrayed by friends and ex-boyfriends. The fucking header. She's a good looking woman as well. I'd give her the tender touch in the heat of the night, but I wouldn't entertain listening to her weird manipulative pub talk for longer than necessary. I too would probably do a Christian and bail, only to be spoken about like I was some kind of passionate Don Juan figure who'd blown into her life like a sensual zephyr of hot-blooded romance, only to be another phony in her eyes, another user, an erotic charlatan tapping up her affection, drawing her life force and spirit like some cosmic psychic vampire, whereas in actual fact, she'd be an unhinged pain in the hole that could do with talking to a therapist that'll help her get to the root cause of her malcontent. But sure, it would make for more attention. I'd just see the same middle-aged men and hunzos fulfilling her wishes any time her story comes up online. You don't need those people in your life, babe. You stick to being you. You are gorgeous. Fuck the haters. Yeah, just take care of yourself and hang out with those people who really care about you. By the way, your body is amazing. DM me, please. That's one half of the hyper-narcissism that you see from people online. The other side is more infuriating. Those fuckers who use humble brags to show off their escalating success. Oh, I was invited with an audience to Bono and I was given an award for amazing achievements in the field of general excellence for being a total fucking genius. But my slacks didn't match my Nike Air 90s. Our fuck off the lot of you. I just want to delete the whole thing to be honest. What the fuck is going on, I ask you? What's happening behind closed doors? Is there trouble at home? Is there jealousy involved? Are there libidinous bad bastards out there vying to steal your beloved partner on the sly? Arranging some sneaky shy-talk activity on the QT? Looking for a bit of side action? You wouldn't know. Some cunt that would gladly steal your woman fairly lively, sending funny gifts, offering a friendly shoulder to beef on. Like the cuckoo then, hopping into your nest without pricking the conscience. It's never been easier to fuck about on the schley. Be wary. Oh! Incredible. We're like a gang of shook ravers, seeking the refuge of a friendly doss house. A place of lamplight and mellow tunes. Ignoring the clatter of empty bottles, thrown into wheelie bins behind nearby pubs. The sound of kids outside making the way to school. So only a matter of time before some big serious bastard comes in, roaring at us. Get out! Go on! Fuck off the lot of you! Oh no, man, please! I don't want to go outside, please! Get out! Oh no! Things are getting that bad now. Boys downloading an app on the phone that gives you an artificial six-pack and photographs. Did you ever hear the likes of it, man? I mean, who could be that insincere to themselves? Did they not think they'd be caught out in real life? I'd rather look rough online and pleasantly surprise people in real life. A bit like Keith Duffy. I met him once up in Dublin. I said, How are you, Keith? You're looking well, horse. You're an Adonis man. To which he replied, Why does everyone keep saying that to me? As if I shouldn't be looking well. Probably because you looked a bit gauzy back in the boys' own days. He's a big unit. He'd be handy out with the dukes. I'd say he'd have no bother dishing out a few clocks and a tight squeeze. And that's gospel, according to Brian Harvey from E17. That old Twitter is the worst of them, in my opinion. Designed to cause nothing but shite. And some proper spiteful cunts altogether. Cry bully prefects taking the moral high ground. With he, she written in their bios. Probably some American college shite that came out of Yale and found his way on the internet pages. Blue haired fatties giving out about their fallen angel, J.K. Rowling. A once financially broke woman 
that hit the big time for writing a load of books about a magical young geek called Harry Potter. She was on the bones of her arse trying to make ends meet until inspiration struck. A lucrative manifestation of posh English kids living in an enchanted fantasy school run by daft looking headers with silly fucking names such as Professor Dumbledork, Buckeye Collins and Jaja Binks. And thaumaturgic big shots dressed up in old cloaks and top hats talking about griffins and snakes. Fair play to her though, she cashed in big style and became a demigod on Twitter. She was hot shit until she recently started talking about turf, which as you know yourself is a free source of energy produced in the bog. I don't know what's up with kids nowadays. When I was a kid, the old lady used to let me sit and watch Predator 2, which had a full on sex scene with a nude Latino woman. King Willie's voodoo henchman hung a Colombian drug dealer upside down, then stabbed him in the chest with a jagged knife before Predator came in and killed them all. It didn't do me any harm watching that stuff. 20 years have passed now since Harry Potter was first published. Since then it's become some sort of weird religion. Any apostates with enough moxie to criticise the franchise are charged with heresy. There was even a Harry Potter witch's coven dedicated to it up the town. It had to be broken up by concerned owl lads with pickaxe handles. It was a bit much to be fair. It was only a treehouse. The witches involved were only eleven-like. Things had gotten that bad that our local parish priest, Topaz McNulty, was forced to take up the issue in mass a few months ago. Word of the incident had reached Rome, came back with a warning for parishioners not to be looking at such divination. He gave a solid gold word that powerful bishops down in Rome didn't approve of the wizard crack in Castletown one bit. These were some seriously heavy dudes. Vatican big ballers wearing intimidating red capes, lined with luxurious pink silk, driving around Tuscany in brand new Ferraris. Topaz said one Sunday, in his own words, that Barry Hopper in the trident of Abraxas was classed as divination. I'm telling you all now, don't you be letting your kids watch that evil demonic black magic shite. Ghouls and feckin' witches, soft lads. Kids flying around the place on broomsticks, cavorting with a big-eared half-goblin dressed in nothing but a sack. That's good, is it? Ah! There was a few groans in the audience that day, I tell you. For a man who told us explicitly not to be watching it, he sure did know a lot about it. As priests go, he's a sound old skin to be fair to him. Bit of a maverick. Golden Gloves boxer back in the day. A brawl broke out last year between the cousins at a funeral. Two big boys went rumbling. Father Minulti waded into the mix demanding they show respect for hollowed ground. Only to be pushed out of the way by a chunky sun-kissed hand draped in solid gold rings. Stay out of this father, he'll be sorry. As lads in shiny slacks and leather jackets went bouncing around the place. Burly men went fighting with an unbridled passion. The pure state of grace. Momentary freedom was to be found in the exchanging of blows with one another, as the Public Order Offence Act was never once a consideration. Sure enough, the melee gained momentum as a stout gentleman accidentally kicked over a large pile of wicker boxes, prematurely liberating 74 snow-white turtle doves due to be released as an allegorical ceremonial gesture, commemorating each year of the dearly departed's life here on planet Earth. White pigeons scattered everywhere creating a fluttering scene of feathers amid ear-splitting screams. Despite the best efforts of the driver shouting, Whoa, 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 I said! Ten beautiful white horses adorned with floral headpieces reared up in terror, losing control as all ten magnificent beasts of burden bolted off blindly down the boring. Coffin still contained within the glass carriage. Wailing accompanied by the scratching of slip-on shoes scrambling across graves decorated with pebble-dashed stones. The dull slapping of clenched fists striking cheeks, reverberating off the granite headstones, body shots, winding a man's empty diaphragm, resembling the tomber that comes with the striking of a Senegalese goatskin drum. Total, utter chaos. There was only one man brave enough to restore the balance. That man was Father Topaz McNulty. Topaz knew he had to step in to quell tensions. He closed up the good book, ran his hand over his pompadour-styled hairdressing, took off the gown 
and rolled the sleeves up. He went to it with the wrath of God behind him, launching himself into the very heart of the action like a mountain lion leaping from a rock ledge onto an unsuspecting wrangle of deer. "'Twas par for the course for Father Topaz. "'After all, his vocation as a priest "'sees him providing spiritual guidance "'to a town recently ranked number 8 "'in Irish Times's top 20 least desirable towns of Ireland. "'He was in his element. "'For a man of 62, he can turn on a penny, "'single-handedly taking on seven of them with ease, "'bobbing and weaving between the headstones like a ninja, "'creating space.' using tombs as obstacles, filtering boys into a narrow funnel to be dispatched one by one, but they only got in each other's way while attempting to assail him. He took a good few shots but kept on rolling with the punches. The fight went on for a good 15 minutes until at last he emerged bloodied on top of a heap of vanquished opponents, after which he received a heartfelt round of applause from both parties. In recognition for his show of honourable valiance, rarely seen in this day and age. After all was said and done, he united the feuding parties and gave the dearly departed a proper send-off. As a show of gratitude, both sides had invited him to the pub afterwards. He went on to drink the lot of them under the table, drove home then, not a bother on him, woke up next morning to do a ten o'clock mass. It made it onto the front of the Western People paper. He's the kind of priest you'd want for any occasion. He's got an American lilt in his voice. We spent a few years in Philly. Brill-creamed hair like Fonzie from Happy Days. He'd kick a ball around with us as young bucks while smoking Benson's in the claw. He's old school. And between you and me and the four walls, rumour has it, he's seen a tidy Ukrainian woman on the side. The whole town knows about it. Nobody bats an eyelid. To be fair, everyone was made up for him. Would have been a waste of talent otherwise. I asked him once after Mass if he had a problem with his watching Lord of the Rings. He said, Ah, yeah, you can watch that. Good old bit of action in it, man. Unlike that Barry Hopper shite. Sure, Tolkien was Catholic. I read his books as a young fella. To be fair, the film was better than the book, in my opinion. Handier than using your imagination like. Even though Christopher Lee, who played Saruman the White, was pissed off about Jackson's adaptation of it in real life. That said, I don't care how good of a reader you are. I read the books myself, and fair play to Peter Jackson. The films were unreal. The Balrog was class, man. He made a strong impression until Gandalf smote his ruin on the mountainside. Made hands of the smoky prick. His ruin was proper smoted, man. Raoul Smote style. A.K.A. Smoty! Self and the boys would often roll up a nice big fat corner back in the day. Had a lovely sit-off while watching Aragorn and the boys kicking the shit out of bad bastards of Middle Earth. Tolkien was a fair hard man himself. A proper serious character. Sure he fought in the trenches of World War I, a.k.a. the Great War, where the global post-industrial revolution tensions ushered in an age of modern warfare. Millions of young men sent to insane levels of slaughter. A bit like the crack in Lord of the Rings 1 beside Mount Doom when Isildur bottled it with the ring and did a runner on Elrond, the Elf King, played by Hugo Weaving. He's got a funny face, that lad. But Tolkien would have witnessed his fair share of casual horror, reflected by Schmeagel guiding Sam and Frodo over the wet marshes, warning them to stay away from the lights. Mr Frodo, there are dead things in the water. A scene inspired from Tolkien looking into flooded shell craters filled with the bodies of young men. Pushed to the front lines of a muddy colourless hellscape. Wave after wave of men sent into sprawling mass of decaying slurry. Faced with going over the top into certain death. Ghostly clouds of mustard gas tangled up in razor wire. Sprayed mercilessly by machine guns. One minute you're sitting down drinking tea. The next minute it's kill or be killed. NCO whistles cutting through the cracking of gunfire. Imagine how it felt, mindlessly running through networks of enemy trenches, guttural streams of dying men fighting for their last breath. To quote one soldier who lived to tell the tale, You don't look, you see. You don't hear, you listen. You taste the top of your mouth. Your nose is filled with fumes and death. The veneer of civilization has dropped away. Rich man's war, poor man's fight. 
I doubt those who lived through the violence of the trenches thought back wistfully to the propaganda that glorified their fate, or the more sinister tactics of recruitment used on conscientious objectors promoted by Charles Penrose Fitzgerald. Men without uniform would gain the public scrutiny of attractive women poking large white feathers into their waistcoats. Men who knew well the crack, wondering what it was all about. Many of those who willingly enlisted were convinced to do so by propaganda think tanks of the era, which is now known as public relations. Renamed by Sigmund Freud's nephew Edward Bayonets, the man who cleverly convinced women into smoking cigarettes on behalf of tobacco lobbyists by calling them torches of freedom. A genius switch and bait maneuver that on one hand appeared as an act of empowering feminine defiance, but on the other hand was a ploy to double the profits of Philip Morris and the boys. Bernays had a deep understanding of the gullibility and daftness of the masses. This is why you, as an individual, need to weigh things up for yourself. Like the roads of Leitrim, you'd want to be cute. Read between the lines. It's a war of words. And it's a battle for your time, your money, and your opinion. Which brings me back succinctly to my discontent with advertising in general and the mind manipulation designed to lure our subconscious into filling the metaphysical vacuum with products we never knew we needed. Irish ad agencies employ the most trustworthy of raspy voiced sweethearts in a bid to soothe your confidence, earnestly whispered into your ear like a good friend. Concerned about your well-being. Floppy-haired thespians struggling to make it after four years of doing an acting degree. Combine that then with the cyclical rejection sequence of countless auditions. If you won't take this part, there's a thousand other actors out there who will. So you can't blame them for wanting to pay the bills. But do they have to sound so fucking annoying? Maybe that's the point. They've gotten your attention. With their pseudo-emotive sentimental shite. They're always one step ahead. Multinational conglomerate companies pretending to care, boshing out virtue signaling, evocative platitudes destined for the hearts and minds of the easily led, already softened up by an anemic educational system that gives us drones just enough information to express content and take orders from above. As my mother would say, Bastards that did it. Walking bastards. Imagine now you found yourself forsaken, stuck on an Alaskan mountainside with nobody around to help you. You need to act fast, make a fire, build shelter from the unyielding indifference of the elements, foraging for food, armed only with a hatchet and a flint. You think back to the Leaving Surf vocational program, aka LCVP, when it taught you how to make CVs that were deemed useless afterwards. It was back in the days of three and a half inch floppies. Funny enough, that reminds me of my final year. When our teacher, not so affectionately known as Mini Hitler, ordered us to click on the on-screen icon saying three and a half inch floppy, to which I eagerly exclaimed, Excuse me, miss. Yes, what is it, Durkin? Mine says seven and a half inch floppy. A mixture of dead silence and snorts of laughter filled the room, decorated with Windows 98 desktops. What did you just say? I said... Mine says seven and a half inch floppy. (gasps) I don't know what angered her more. Was it the sheer shock value and gall I had in confidently repeating myself? Or the chic of my inflection? The tone of voice used to accentuate the generous girthy dimensions of my flaccid penis. A bit like fucking Gimli son of Gloin. She was very quick over short distances. I had to make like a pair of skinny jeans and split before she landed the claw on me. I was out the door, and away off home to ride out the shitstorm. I let the dust settle for a few days before coming back. Like an outlaw on the western plains, it wasn't long until I was finally reprimanded for my quintessentially uncouth bravado. A letter was written in my journal detailing my statement in quotes. I was then sent directly to the study hall, where I met other juicy raconteurs, with little respect for the halls of education. Other rebels from third year up to leave insert, thrill-seeking desperados living life in the moment without a care in the world for the expanses of academic life outside of Castletown. Corridor marauders happily throwing chances of good grades to the wind in search of attention, adulation from peers and the big fun. A spectrum of dodginess spanning from class clowns 
to future career criminals. I said, how are you boys? Any fucking crack? I presented my journal from my grey school pants, throwing it down amongst them. Read it and weep, cons. Bobby the Mallard Hennigan picked it up, unanimously taking the lead in reading it. He was a heavy set lad from two classrooms down the hall. He drove a Massey Ferguson tractor into school each day. He wore a tight leather jacket that looked like a round bale of silage around his shoulders. The kind of jacket that you'd see hunched over middle aged pissheads like the fella who heckled Pat Kenny on the Late Late Show was wearing. Probably passed on to him from the uncle back from England who had accidentally left it in the house while visiting his parents. It would be a case of Take that jacket there, your Uncle Pat said you could have it. He won't be back till next year. He was the kind of lad you'd see in the background of a scrap. He'd be slyly loving it, egging on the fracas of other lads, going toe-to-toe in the ball alley during lunch. He'd be like an armadillo, hard on the outside, soft as shite underneath. The kind of book who'd say he'd have your back outside a teenage disco when faced with the prospect of fighting a reckless gaggle of testosterone-boosted hard lads under the influence of a flagon of Linden Village cider. You'd turn around to see if he's got your back, but he's done a David Copperfield on it and disappeared like dust in the wind. Pure Kansas job. Upon reading the journal, I saw his eyebrows lifting. He began reading it out loud. I sat back intent, basking in the glory of being an unruly cheeky prick. Unbeknownst to myself, my principal, Marty Blarney, was watching it on the CCTV camera mounted up in the corner. There were all manner of lads coming up to me, shaking me hand, thanking me for making the school a better place. Suddenly, there's a school-wide announcement on the intercom. Eddie Durkin report to the principal's office now. You're fucked now, Durkin said a shrill-sounding voice watching from far back in the corner. It was a young Francis, the Viper Higgins, wringing his hands gleefully, taking the crack out of my righteous sacrifice in the name of cheap laughs. Oh, ho, 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 hey. Big man on campus, yeah? A regular Zach Morris, aren't you? Saved by the bell job. What's it to you, Higgins? Shouldn't you be in national school with the rest of the fucking babies? I shouted back. Big words from a small man, he fired back again. Little shite was trying to get into my mind. I'm bigger than you are, McFuck, and don't you ever forget it, or you'll get that, I said with my shaking fist, raised in anger. Oh, small words for big man. I'll see you around, Durkin. Uptown. Better watch out. I've got an American-style flick knife. I'll make you cry, like a boo-boo man. I'd be watching horror movies like Jeepers Creepers and Wesley Snipes' Blade. So you know well I'm handy with the steel and I drive a scrambler. I'm one bad bastard. Are you threatening to do me in, are you? Is that a threat, Francis? No, Durkin. It's a veiled threat. Yeah! I was confused as to why there was such hostility from Higgins. He didn't like the fact I'd waltzed into the study hall like Van Damme on chats rightfully taking credit for my audacious behaviour and crude verbiage in Hitler's class. He was jealous and wanted to make a bollocks out of me. There was now an audience of classroom outcasts watching, hoping to see things escalate further. I knew I was on thin ice with Blarney as he watched through the camera, now screaming over the entire school intercom for me to get to his office. I had to hand it to Higgins on this one. It was never about the threats, it was about him using cunning guile to stall me long enough to have the principal shout my name through every classroom, to be heard by staff and pupils alike. Viper delayed me long enough to turn my juvenile achievement into a spectacle. It would be one of many altercations we would have over the years, but in the fleeting moments before I took my impending retribution from Blarney, I couldn't help but marvel at his calculating motives. Staring back at me, head slightly lowered, grinning away from behind the shades, he thoroughly relished in it. I thought to myself, if I'm going down, I'm going to bring him down with me. I reached into my school bag, grabbed a bottle of Yople Yop drinking yogurt, unscrewed it, took a nice swig and fucked the bottle straight at him, covering him and those around him in strawberry yogurt. His face now doused in dairy. My eyes! He screamed. 
I'll see you around, man, I said, turning to the rowdy boys with a wink. Talk to you wank chefs later. Ha ha. They nodded as I faced the fate that awaited in the principal's office. I knew I was in the shit, but I didn't let it show. I put the head up, walked out, and took the medicine. So yeah, back to Alaska. Remember, this is a rant about adverts and how we learned fuck all real world skills outside school. You'd be thinking back to algebra lessons or what the biology teacher told you about phototropism. How plants grow towards sources of light. Sure it's handy to know once you've got a few fucking hash plants in the ground. But fuck all use if you're being chased by a pack of ravenous timber wolves. There's one thing a playground would have taught me, at least. How to clock a grizzly bear in the mush and run like Jedward on a bag of Michael D. School was a waste of time, man. There were boys who were laughed at for leaving after the junior cert, who went on to pick up the tools and started learning a trade. A skilled tradesman can go anywhere, same as the farmer or the fisherman. Men work in the land day and night, understanding the significance of lunar cycles and changing seasons. Hands deep within the microbacterial life that ebbs and flows within the soil, or fighting through the squally white horses of the North Atlantic. Then compare the content of their character, of those noble blue-collar working men with pencil-necked big tech gurus like Bill Gates or talent TV competition judges who have become obscenely wealthy, exploiting talentless fuckwits or weepy prospective hopefuls fallen on tough times, forced to sing their way through the misery of life, only to be picked up and taken so far, like Honey G from X Factor or Subo Boyle from Britain's Got Talent. In fairness to Simon Cowbell, he did give her the start, but I tell you this, wasn't out of the goodness of his heart. The creepy cunt. Fucking adverts, I hate them so much. I've been on the wine, so I have. Helps loosen the fingers. Drink can be an Irish writer's best friend in those lonely, late night scribing sessions. When you're stuck deliberating what to put in it, what to take out, battling these voices of whining cunts on Twitter out to blackball you, or far out relatives sneering in the wings, hoping you'll piss in your own bed. Fuck the lot of you. I'll do what I want, and no cunt on God's green earth will stop me. Whoa, Durkin, slow down, man. Take the edge off. Have an old toot of the Kingston Cush there for yourself, galad. Sorry about that. That was one big epic rant there, on account of me sitting down to watch a bit of RT1 with the old lady. Newsreaders pumping out as much fear and bad news as they possibly can. God forgive them for putting the willies up the arses of the ignorant. Then when you think you're in for a reprieve during the ad break, only to hear those smooth talking voices selling you zany sounding motor insurance packages, or cloying sentimental mythical aged dorky dwelling owl books reminiscing about the power of stout. The passion, the pride, the explosive surge of Guinness. Do you ever remember the advert back in 2007, do you? The Lord of the Rings style Ents that were playing rugby and they came together to form one half of a scrum. Born of her land. Do you remember that, do you? As Yates would have said, Romantic Ireland is dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. Whoever the fuck he was. Any relation to Tinhead O'Leary from Brookside? No. Fucking make you wonder. Voiceovers. Bring back a few of those depressing road safety adverts, that's what I say. Bit of shock value. Seriously though, I used to love watching those ads. They were proper shock tactics. Three dead in this vehicle. The lad without the seatbelt at the damage. There was a whole load of them. One of them showed a young whippersnapper of a man out on a Super Sunday session with the boys after a bit of footy. Frenchie always said he looked like Credo's brother, Decky. Man of the World by Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac played as the lovely pints went down a treat. He takes the carrying home, but accidentally makes an unexpected detour through a back garden fence and power munches into a young lady playing on the swing. Never ever drink and drive, says the morose Nordy voiceover artist. They must have some crack coming up with these commercials, man. Imagine them all sitting around in pitching sessions, blocking out the premise, 
to be as sentimentally relevant as possible, then the events leading up to the brutal set piece that typically comes with an inconceivably coincidental set of circumstances unfolding like something out of a Michael Bay movie. It's usually a car flipping or a pedestrian being clocked while crossing the road looking at the phone. One of my all-time favourites was the 1995 classic set in a red RS Ford Escort rigged up with tasty spotlights and five-spoke metallic wheels job. Ooh, smooth job altogether. Your man pilot in the vehicle takes his blonde girlfriend out for a Sunday drive. She's fucking nice, hey. Tidy out. Probably does a bit of body balance and yoga. It starts off with her hopping in, giving him a romantic kiss. It goes to his centre parted head. He starts acting the bollocks at the wheel. Thinks he's Johnny Logan after a 24 slab of Pratsky. A royalty free cover of I can see clearly now the rain has gone accompanies the events. He begins weaving, meandering like a total bell through traffic. Just before the climactic crescendo comes to its peak, another royalty free rendition of ACDC's I'm on a highway to hell accompanies his car as it splits the rear end of a mini metro like a stray tangerine caught under teenage feet in a playground scuffle. A bottle of Fanta spins around like a fizzy Catherine wheel on the road, while a teddy bear and a young girl lie motionless on the wet asphalt. Onlookers, mouths agape, upside down owlads hanging out of car doors, gazing confusedly at the now contrite, gelled haired speed racer as he stands with a face on him, like Brezzy in a hash cafe. Another royalty-free offering, this time Swedish 80s pop duo, Roxette. It must have been love, but it's over now. Plays, as a judge can be heard saying, 10 years for dangerous driving. Ways up, slow down, expect the unexpected. Should didn't I just get caught watching a DOE road safety PSA reel, the best of 95 to 2016 there on YouTube? I must say, it was powerful and it would make you think. I'll be sure to take it handy on the pints while driving blindfold, beside a busty lady of the night dishing out magic sweeties and waffle dust to me, doing 90 mile an hour down the old bog road. All jokes aside, having a bit of cop on while driving is never a bad thing, never a bad thing. Back in 07, not long after Bugenhagen got the car, himself, myself, Buzz and Frenchy were tipping along nicely through the winding country roads after leaving Buzz's MacPad. We were heading to Loch Lana Gym in Castle Bar to exercise the demons, sweat out the badness from the preceding weekend. We were having a conversation about how fit we were in those days. Boo states, if we didn't drink, we'd be athletes. To which Buzz answered, if we didn't train, we'd be alcoholics. It was mid-December. A big session was planned in Galway for New Year's Eve. Villa, a big Norwegian lad who the lads had befriended one night after CP's nightclub, had invited us to a private fetish party. He was hosting it in Salt Hill. We were all overly excited at the prospect of going to a big posh house full of women, dressed to the gills in latex and erotic PVC clobber. Drink included. It was shaping up to be the session of a lifetime. So the crack was extra explosive. Due to the lashing rain coming straight at us, visibility outside the windscreen was minimal. That wasn't a particular issue though. Sure, we were used to such conditions, par for the course in wintry Mayo, as we were travelling at 40 miles an hour. Boo Boo Dolls had only recently become a provisional patron of the roads. He was unhinged of late, easily excited at the prospect of Villa's gaff. When Buzz asked him, are you looking forward to the New Year's party of Villa's Boo? Just after a brief pregnant pause, in advance of a pre-pondered response, he exclaimed, I'll tell you how excited I am! And without warning, he dropped the clutch, pulled the handbrake and locked the wheel left. The car flipped instantly. We were hurled over the ditch, rotating over and over, crashing through branches in the hedgerows, through snapping lengths of barbed wire fences, and with it, the anchored wooden stakes. Went the sound of the deafening screams from inside the car. The rolling continued until at last we came to a stop. The micro was now stationary. Roof down, wheels up. 
still spinning in fourth gear. We unbuckled the seatbelts and climbed out, looking at the scene. Miraculously, we were unscathed. Maybe we should turn the engine off before the car explodes, said Frenchie with hurried concern. What are you on about? Sure, that's only in the movies, Boo responded. Buzz chimed in by saying, Yeah, made up all shite like that car insurance bollocks. Sure, a good night was had afterwards, and that was the main thing. Am I right? Another time, Boo and I were off to do a bit of surfing and then a scroll with Frenchie. Board strapped to the roof. There was a palpable sense of excitement as we saw the Atlantic swell peeling in cleanly on that early April afternoon. An offshore breeze propped up the face of the waves. A good four foot clean dark green razor thin white tips spraying back against the vast horizon of the Atlantic. Surf's up! Remember that film? A film about a load of penguins who lived in Hawaii and all they did was surf all day. It reminds me of our old friend Sean from New Zealand, a mate of ours who lived in Dublin and he worked in Cineworld on Parnell Street. He told me how he was once ushering the matinee screening of Surf's Up and had to eject a pair of Scaldies. Your man dressed in Adidas Firebird tracksuit bottoms and a Nike Air Max tracksuit was getting a blower off a Howie with massive gold hoop earrings. He asks Sean to at least give him the courtesy of letting him finish the job. I guess some men are just on a mission. A mission to empty the sack, no matter how inappropriate their surroundings may be. We approached a sharp bend heading right into Anascrone from the less scenic route coming directly from Ballina. Boo's trajectory was a little too quick. With a jolt of unexpected gusto, both left wheels lifted off the road and we were only half a pubic hair away from being totally airborne. All we could do was desperately look at each other for reassurance. Everything was now in slow motion, as the both of us let out a mutual terrified shriek of uncertainty. Ah! I'll never forget the following seconds, staring into French Toast's now super wide blue eyes. For it was the first time I had noticed that Frenchie's iris have a slight green golden corona orbiting his pupils. I studied the furrowed lines decreasing deeper on his pale forehead, the stubble on his chin, the square shape of his lips as he let out a mid-yelp. It felt like a moment from the Matrix, except we were totally at the mercy of physics, riding the tides of momentum. And just as quick as it had happened, the wheels touched ground again as Boo regained control of his course. Fuck's sake, lads, what are you screaming about, you pair of daft bastards, yet? Yeah. He gave out to us for being genuinely frightened. We landed at the beach later on, togged out beside the windswept lifeguard tower. We met a middle-aged Irish-American bearded guy, a sound grey-haired dude from Oregon. He took us out past the break using a rip in the tide, fast-tracked through the struggle of the surf. Self and Frenchy paused before paddling in to catch the next set. He turned to me and said, Fuck me! Did Boo get the license? License, I said. She hasn't even had a lesson. But to be fair to Boo Boo Dolls, he's been a steady pilot for many's a moon now. And I feel a lot more comfortable with him these days. He's older, and with age comes cop on. His motor of choice, a 96 metallic bronze Nissan Micra, affectionately known as the battle tank. You just couldn't break it, given a nice toot of the horn when needed. Fuel consumption was 49 miles per gallon. She was a miser on juice. 0 to 60 in 16 seconds. Max top speed, 93 miles an hour. A curb weight of 800 kilograms, naturally aspirated inline four-cylinder engine, petrol motor, 54 bhp, 40 kilowatt, at 6,000 rpm. Front wheel drive with a 5 speed manual gearbox. You'd easily get 102 going downhill. She was a little workhorse. Slow down. Expect the unexpected. That goes for life itself. We'd be running around town behaving like GTA East Mayo if we could. Randomly hammering people on the street and getting chased by the 5 0 until you eventually ran off the road and shot dead before the camera pans down to a planned view of you and your lifeless body, saying, Wasted. There'd be a crowd of people then on the road, standing around having a good gawk at you, saying, Look at that dead header there. He had it coming to him in a big way. It reminds me of the time local header Thomas Shaw fell off his 250cc Suzuki sport bike up the town, 
He pulled out in front of Clive McGinty, an old buck driving a maroon Toyota Carina E 1.6 lean burn. Clive was from the old school world of driving etiquette. He's one of those fortunate farmers given a license in the early 80s without having to take a stitch of a test. The likes of him think they're special boys. Shaw was a quasi-dodgy leather-clad rogue teen who would be sound to you if you were alone with him, but he'd turn on you if you were in strange company to save his own skin from a squash hammering in a sports hall. He got involved with the dance scene, selling Mitsubishi pills and nodges of Moroccan diesel hash with lumps of plastic strewn into it. He was riding his white motorcycle bike uptown. Suddenly McGinty pulls out. McGinty is one of those dangerous ignorant cunts that shouldn't be on the road. By the psychological fact that he was just given a right to drive, he conflates that with being granted state immunity to do as he pleases while driving. Keeping it under 40 miles an hour, he's the kind of boy that would hog the centre of the road, preventing you from safely overtaking. You'll meet these people on the roads in Ireland. Are they pissed? Or losing it? Maybe both. Or are they conceited owlets that enjoy the feeling of eyeballing headlights burning a hole into the back of their seats? Stubborn mules of men in old suit jackets and flat caps, smiling sardonically as you finally pass them out. They just keep looking ahead, laughing. You can well imagine the internal dialogue they be having inside their bony skulls. Why should I pull in to the hard shoulder for the likes of those bastards? They must get some weird kick out of creating a three mile convoy behind them, having a negative time permutation in the butterfly effect of rural Irish midland life. There's not much you can do in a situation like that, other than stick on the high beams, drive right up behind them bumper to bumper, flashing the lights, beeping the horn furiously, intimidating them as best you can in an attempt to fishtail them off the road in a sensual T-bone odyssey. Even better is when you have the likes of an absolute player, Buzz McDonald, who like a wild animal will climb out of the window of the car like a nutter from Mad Max 2, holding onto the roof just to throw tangerines and Brazil nuts he purchased prior to the trip. Hold you like these nuts, can't, risking life and limb just to prove he's in the right. That's a solid wingman if ever there was one. It sounds harsh, but you're actually helping to save lives. So back to McGinty. He pulls out, right out in front of Shaw. Leaving him with no time to break. I know for a fact McGinty saw him, but he didn't give a wank at the time. I wouldn't mind, but if you met Clive in the pub or up in Tesco, he's a lovely man. He's got a fine trio of daughters, all doing very well for themselves. Just whatever it is that gets into him when he's behind the wheel is anyone's guess. It's like he's possessed. He drove right out without stopping. Head forward, self-assured, didn't bat an eyelid, as Shaw crashed right into the front panel, flying straight over the bonnet, crash landing head first into the asphalt. Sparks flying, plastic fairings, fiberglass strands cracking, busting like clean cigarette butts put into a blender. Like hail. Cubic particles of glass ricocheting off curb stones. Luckily for Shaw, he was wearing his helmet. Otherwise, he'd be another statistic used in morbid road safety authority commercials. Speaking of which, I was watching Sky Sports the last day. They were showing an intensely morbid and tragic story of a woman who'd lost her angelic young son and shattered her leg when struck by a drunk driver. It was hard not to feel her pain. It was followed directly then with a Guinness Hop House 13 commercial. Now, I'd enjoy a drop of Hop House as much as the next man, and credit where it's due, for a conglomerate such as Diageo, cashing in on recent years' customer enthusiasm for hoppy craft beers, they've not done a bad job at all. It's fucking nice, hey? But to be put on directly after a DUI prevention piece takes some balls. So Shaw was lying there in a state of shock, motionless on the footpath. There was a funeral going on across the street. Hundreds of respect payers walked over to inspect the damage. For seven hours, they all stood looking at the wreckage. The bike. Then Shaw. Then the bits. Then back to the bike. Back up to Shaw. Chat. Chat that gave way to yet more surveying of the damage. Shaw. The bike. The faces. It was already a solemn scene due to the funeral. 
made even more serious. Even though Shaw himself was grand, his anonymity had come to pass. When he was unmasked by paramedics, a gasp filled the air. Even though everyone knew it was Shaw, it was kind of like a Scooby-Doo moment, where the most obvious villain turned out to be the actual villain. You knew who it was, but you still wanted to double check and give yourself a pat on the back and say, fair play to you on the basic intuition there, hey. Without a second glance in the wing mirror, McGinty didn't even bother his whole stopping to see if he was alright. Doubt he even bothered checking the wing mirror. He probably thinks mirrors are just a decorative feature. And with that, he just tipped off nicely into the heat of that summer evening. Nobody shouted stop. They knew where to find him later on. I overheard a beautiful conversation between Pacino Kinsler and Rudolf O'Shea. Kinsler asked O'Shea if the bike was indeed a write-off. To which O'Shea responded, Oh yeah, hi, he fell right off it. You could smell the shame in the air. Shaw was one of a handful of a particular demographic. Wild boys on bikes. He'd become centre stage in the spectacle. No longer aloof, consoled by concerned middle-aged women, giving him ham and cheese sandwich triangles and a sugary cup of strong tea. His mystery cruiser veneer was now in the rearview mirror. People saw him on the bike but couldn't work out who it was. Out of all the lads into the biking crack, they have a certain element of danger to them. Living on the edge, braving the throngs of inconsiderate shitehawk drivers, potholes, blankets of rain, black ice, and winding bends strewn with fecklessly slow tractors. Taking the race line, split-second decision-making, blitzing in and out between omnidirectional certain death, riding the broken white lines at the middle of the road. Shaw was lucky enough that he didn't sustain any serious injuries during the collision that day, but his faithful Japanese steed was done for. He finished up his time in Youthreach, and off he went to the States to start over. Youthreach, or for some reason it's called Ute Ridge by its students, was a government-sponsored halfway vocational school designed for boisterous teens, lured into learning a craft that was incentivized by 40 quid a week. Myself and Frenchie thought of going to this institution. It seemed like some sort of magical place where you get paid to go to school and DOS. It all sounded too good to be true. Just ask Kevin Ian Kelly. He went there after the junior cert. Caught under the allure of 40 quid a week for building walls, cutting a few lengths of timber and playing fruit machines all day. It was, in actual fact, too good to be true. The kinds of hard lads you would meet at teenage discos with shaved heads and curly locks for fringes, blowing cigarette smoke into your face, while accusing you of talking shit about them, despite the fact you've never seen them before in your life. They all had daft nicknames such as Broccoli and Comrade, Snackbox and Smoothie. They all came from Bal Town, a town revered by young fellas for the sheer volume of unhinged tough guys it pumped out of the place. Contrary to the toughness of Bal, it had its fair share of tasty women to offset the negativity. It was a town you only ever heard of through local lads from home who'd forged a bond with the Ute Reach boys while collaborating with these dangerous acquaintances in beating the living shit out of other groups of kids from rival towns. I was always a lover more so than a fighter. I enjoy chatting to the women more so than throwing unsolicited headbutts into the face of other lads for no reason. Thanks to the teenage disco crack, I had enough experience with these lunatics, and when I found out they were all up in youth reach, I thought to myself, fuck that crack man. I might be a bit unhinged, but I'm not a total cha-cha boy. Poor old Kevin Ian Kelly found out the hard way at our bequest. On that faithful day he landed into youth reach playground, which, in essence, was pretty much a chain-link cubic cage designed to stop the young beasts from escaping during break time and terrorising school kids and the locals of Culture Ma. Kelly was a sensitive soul. He lacked discipline. Finding school boring and unfulfilling, his parents were too busy to notice the potential artistry burning with inside his soul. He came from a family of artsy sound skins, fiddle players, and sound older brothers who drove about in Toyota Starlets, wearing long sleeve black t-shirts with pictures of Kirk Cobain on them. Nirvana, the sound of the 90s. 
It just sounded class, especially the song Breed on Nevermind. It seemed to contain the frustration felt by those of us who yearned for opportunity, a place of imagination without limits. Cool boys in America, unplugged in New York. The Kelly brothers were of that ilk, sound country lads who played GA on lunch breaks, playing pool down in the pub after 4pm, writing the names of cool bands on the walls, such as Pearl Jam, Aerosmith and Curb Dog, smoking Benson's behind school. Kevin Ean, being the youngest, had fallen through the cracks. He got in with the wrong crowd there for a while. No big deal, it happens to everyone. I couldn't tell you if it was all part of an initiation process or what. With striking immediacy, he was unfortunate enough to find out the visceral truth of Utrich brutality. Cautionary legend had it, soon as you land up into that cage at morning break, the whole place turns on you, battering the living shit out of new arrivals for no reason other than it being a bizarre testosterone driven hazing ritual. Kevin Ean wasn't the fighting type. He was just a slight of build messer with an empathetic soul. They kicked the poor lad around like a beach ball in a Pantera mosh pit. Mercilessly chasing him with the crazed ferocity of those chimpanzees caught on David Attenborough's jungle excursion where a gang of jacked up chimps hunted and killed a monkey during a manic bloodthirsty nosh fest. They batted poor Kevin Ean so badly that he ended up in hospital for a week with a broken eye socket and a ruptured spleen. They claimed that it was for his own good to temper him in the fires of Crom. The PTSD incurred after the hammering was so intense for poor old Kevin, he didn't even leave the house for a year, totally shell-shocked by the time he came back to school. We did our best to make him feel welcome. We shown him the height of fair dues. Those of us thinking about leaving Shkulwara Uggis Shtivi changed their opinions upon hearing the news of his grave punishment. Any of us foolhardy enough to have notions of Uteridge happily conceded and said, School it is. School it is. Kevin Ean was happy to be back. He realised the grass was actually greener in school. We all made sure to be extra nice to him upon his return. Made a big fuss of him. Made him feel better in a bid to psychologically rehabilitate him, easing him back into public life. I was talking earlier on about GTA, Grand Theft Auto. I first heard of it back in 1998, when Gary Brennan, an old school friend of mine, was talking about it on the PlayStation 1. He told me that there was lads swearing in it and everything. You could run people over in cars and do handbrakes in their blood, leaving red skid marks. To a rowdy teenager such as myself, it was exactly what I needed, just to break out for no reason. To be fair though, if you want my genuine perspective on the GTA franchise, it was all downhill after Vice City. Vice City was funnier, looked cooler, and it was based on Scarface and Miami Vice. The 80s style was a novel touch, and the soundtrack was busting it up to the mazoon and back, with those butter-faced Australian softies, Savage Garden. Hands on them like a caramello dairy milk he left in the back pocket and forgot about it when you were filling up the car from Cora Boyle. All mashed up and stuck to the left cheek of your buttock. Soon as I figured out what the cheats were, I would just go around shooting at the cops and get five stars and go out in a blaze of glory. It was amazing. I did it for hours in the bedroom, volume up full blast with the old lady giving out to me for my total lack of productivity. She'd be shouting at me, Did you take the ashes out of the fire? Did you run the hoover around? Sure the place was full of dishes. You didn't clean up properly. Giving out to me all the time she was. San Andreas was alright. And then came number five. And at that point I'd lost interest to be honest with you. Taking orders. Don't scratch the boss's car. Pick up the woman there, good lad. Don't be getting the hop, you hear me? Do my tax returns. Get me some shopping. Make the bed. Would you ever fuck off? I'd be paid to do all that shite in real life, getting a job doing home help. Who in her adult life has the time these days for doing all those jobs for XP points? Back in the day though, man. Tommy Vassetti, voiced by Rayleigh Otter, was an unreal character. 
First time I played Vice City, I didn't leave the house for two weeks. I met CSI Steve and the brother, Alan Dual Quad Pentium Processor. They were on the way up to Dublin to buy it. I didn't even know it was out, man. Dual Quad Pentium Processor got the nickname for being handy out with computers. He used to go around to people's houses. Anyone who had a computer, he'd go up to it and press Control, Alt and Delete and say he was accessing the mainframe. We were all mesmerised by his basic knowledge of computing, which he learned up in Schlego IT. He talked like those boys from shite 90s hacker movies, such as Hackers. What were they hacking exactly? I'd love to know what these hacker boys to be at. Did they be sitting about in anonymous masks, guessing passwords, what's the story? Like the time Julian Assange got done for sharing America's snidey carry-on over in Iraq. He wasn't done for releasing state secrets, was Assange. He was done for revealing state crimes. And let's face it man, America was built on crime. It's pretty much one massive doll Aaron, armed with missiles and SWAT teams jumping out of Black Hawks, at the touch of a button. At the end of the day, they can say or do whatever they like, because anyone who talks bad about them gets bumped off. Then you have those daft brain dead bastards to say, it's only a conspiracy, to which I said, you must be a coincidence theorist. All it is, when you think about it, are hugely elaborate heists planned out by ruthless billionaires and spineless politicians at the expense of the taxpayer. Don't take my word for it. Look it up there on the web pages. Looking back over the years, a man get off nostalgic. You might say, Eddie, would you have done anything differently now with the knowledge you've gained from life? No. Fuck it. As the great philosopher Ronan Keaton once said, life is a roller coaster, you just gotta ride it. Could I have done things differently? Yeah, in fairness, like. The planning wasn't too bad, it was just bad execution. Like the time we had the Foamy Nights party back in Buzz's cottage in 2009. We took 10 euro on the door to have a phone party that turned into a rave. Lads ended up off their heads on chats. Myself included. That's how the Viper managed to steal our taken for the event. We were too speckled to understand what he was doing with our money. Just let him off with it in good faith. The base was just so hard, man. I didn't care at the time. It wasn't until the come down kicked in. And kicked in hard. It was like a Glaswegian fireman's size 10 Wellington boot smashing through the doors of my mind. Wouldn't be the first time one of my plans had gone awry. What can I say? What you do in haste, you can repent at leisure. Too seriously was the degree that I did take the mantra of Limp Biscuit frontman Fred Durst's 2001 My Way, My Way or the Highway from best-selling album Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavor Water. Yeah, cheers Fred. Took a fool's advice there, man. What if I just listened to my career guidance counsellor I was talking about a few chapters back and done that computing course? Could have been an IT consultant specialist making insane coin. Not only was it DCU I turned down, I was given a place in DIT Bolton Street to become a car mechanic. Fuck that off too. I were looking back, I should have got a trade under my belt. Made a load of handy wedge and married a hot English milf like Rod Stewart's ex, Rachel Hunter. She was nice. Especially in that music video, Stacy's Mom by Fountains of Wayne. Some pop outfit from the mid noughties. Many people wouldn't know, but the band found its name from an episode of Series 2 of The Sopranos. A shop in the episode that sold water fountains. Tony gets a speeding ticket from a jobsworthy cop, played by actor James S. Dutton. You might remember him as a sound bald black lad, seeking spiritual redemption in a penal colony out in some shithole in space. Fair play to him, he saved Ellen Ripley from getting done in by a bunch of intergalactic skinhead wrongins in Alien 3. Don't know what was worse, those lads, or the Rottweiler Xenomorph running around dimly lit corridors picking boys off one by one. That was some dark sci-fi shit right there, man. After Alien 3, it was all downhill from there, really. The Aliens vs Predator franchise was a fucking waste of time, man. Total washout. I'd write better fucking scripts on the back of me fucking sack. Fuck's sake, man. I've only gone off on yet another tangent. Get used to it, I suppose. 
It's going to happen a lot. Where was I? Oh yeah, getting married to a posh English milf like Rachel Hunter. You know the type. Someone who plays polo and attends posh country clubs, driving around the Cotswolds in a sweet motor. Ah well, what are you going to do? I'm sure it'll come of its own set of problems, such as her Hackett embossed, esteemed circle of friends, treating me like some kind of proletariat sideshow. It would probably be like a luxury prison, but my Jimmy would be well looked after. Saying that though, probably ending a divorce. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Who knows, man? In conclusion, every day on life's road is filled with multiple turns. You gotta do your best to navigate your way through the shitstorm of decision making. And sometimes, life throws in a default opportunity that you never saw coming. And you never know that big break you've been after could be right round the corner. And the great thing is about it, it was totally out of your control and worked out for the best thing that ever happened to you. Life is funny sometimes. The best thing to ever happen to you can arrive disguised as the worst thing that can happen to you. A bit of advice to take away from all this will stand to you. Sometimes bad things don't happen to you, they happen for you. So take it handy out there for now. Slow down. Expect the unexpected. And as Bill and Ted would say, be excellent to one another. Biatch!